All right, great to be with you guys tonight as we look through the book of Leviticus, um, and we have with us Spear and Austin tonight. Great to see you guys. And what we're doing as a church, we're encouraging people to read through the Bible together. And so we're kind of dealing with going through the Bible and the question and answers. Clearly, um, uh, covering a lot of ground, 27 chapters in the book of Leviticus. Uh, we have six questions here that some verses and passages come up in the book of Leviticus. So let's kind of jump into these, and Spear is going to read them, and uh, also going to be reading some verses on, although we don't have too many verses to read for the first question. But anyway, if you'll read the first question, Spear, and we'll jump right into that. The book of Levit Leviticus is one of the more difficult books of the Bible to understand. Is there any special context we need to know to help us understand this book? What does the title of the book mean, and what is the purpose of the book? Well, Leviticus is a challenging book, um, primarily because we are unfamiliar with it. Um, in fact, I've heard it said about um, Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy, there is a little... Um, uh, kind of rhyme that goes lost in Leviticus, numb in numbers, and drifting through Deuteronomy. <laughs> and um, perhaps that is true because of our unfamiliarity with these books and the entire sacrificial system. But um, speaking of the title, the book of Leviticus is named for the Levites, the members of the tribe of Levi. This was the, uh, the priestly tribe, and also the Levites helped out the priest in the work of the ministry. So <clears throat> that's it tells you kind of what it is. It's dealing with the work of the Levites, uh, the priesthood, and the various things there. Um, the purpose of the book, um, not just Leviticus, but um, uh, even going back to uh, the last half of Exodus, from about 20 on in Exodus, and then Leviticus and, and Numbers and Deuteronomy, which is the second giving of the law, um, it provides a basis or really what can only be described as building a nation. Um, let's kind of go through this. Children of Israel come out of Egypt, and they are a group of, of workers, slaves. Um, takes them about a month or so to get to Mount Sinai. They spend about a year <coughs> at Mount Sinai, and um, then they are going to go into the Promised Land. So really in 13 months, they're supposed to be from the exodus, leaving Egypt, into the promised land. Only problem is somehow they managed to turn that 13 months into 40 years because of their disobedience. But at any rate, that's another ball game. That whole generation had to die off. And so you had all these um, uh, funerals taking place <coughs> over that long period of time. But at any rate, in the year they spent at Mount Sinai, which then they were, they were supposed to go directly into the promised land. You know, just, they added another 39 years to it. A nation is built. Um, you have the laws given, starting with the Ten Commandments. And now the Ten Commandments are the basis of all laws, almost of all societies, if you think of it. You know, the, the relationship to God, especially the one's relationship with man, you know, um, uh, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, you know, so on and so forth. And then those are expanded. So you have the building of a law. You have the identity given to them because there's a central worship place. The tabernacle is built. And um, uh, this nation is a theocracy. God is to head this nation. Um, you have a priesthood there to be in charge of it. And then you have holy days and, 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 and great, uh, the great feast days, the fast days, um, <clears throat> the um, great celebration of Passover, um, the uh, uh, first fruits, the... Um, uh, Tabernacles, booths, um, uh, and um, so on and so forth. So you have these <clears throat> three great days, and you have others, the Day of Atonement and things of that nature. So you establish a nation, you establish its holidays, you establish the meaning of it. And so that's really what the book of Leviticus is about, kind of establishing a nation. And this nation is to be holy unto the Lord God. So <clears throat> the book of Leviticus gives some instruction for that. You guys have any thoughts on that? I just think of a God being a God of order and structure, and he's kind of laying out the ground rules and the laws and the rules to, to set them apart, and how they're, yeah. they're different from, from the rest of the world. And they are very different. Um, do they do a good job of following their laws? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, if you were um, a law enforcement officer here, then um, uh, 
Austin, you'd have plenty of arrests to make, wouldn't you? <laughs> there you go. There you go. But anyway, that's you know the book of Leviticus, and and sometimes we don't understand it from the point of. But if you think of it in the point of understanding of, of building this nation that's supposed to be holy to God, then it does start to make some kind of sense. Um, so anyway, let's jump into the second question. All right. According to Leviticus one verse four, the burnt offering was to make atonement on his behalf. What does atonement mean? How could offering an animal as a burnt offering make atonement for a person before God? And so, um, uh, Austin, why don't you read uh, chapter 1, verse 4, and then you turn, if you would, Spear, to Psalm 32, 1, and we'll read that after, um, after Austin reads uh, chapter 1, verse 4 of Leviticus. He shall lay his hands on the head of the burnt offering, that it may be accepted for him to make an atonement on his behalf. So <clears throat> here's this animal is sacrificed, and it goes into some pretty lengthy details we won't go into about what kind of animal could be offered in the burnt offering was presented. Okay, read Psalm 32, 1, if you would, Spirit. Psalm 32, 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the whole thing to make atonement, it, the word atonement really means to cover. Cover. So... When the sacrifice was offered, the uh, sin of the person that is offering the sacrifice was done. You have a burnt offering, you have a sin offering, you have a guilt offering, you have uh, the votive offerings, the free will offerings, you, you have all kinds of offerings and sacrifices, so I'm not going to get too deep into those um, tonight and... <clears throat> It, it, it does get very confusing. But anyway, so the burnt offering was a complete. Uh, some of these offerings, the priest would eat part of it, and that was how they would. But anyway, the burnt offering is, like I said, it is a burnt offering. The whole thing is consumed and burnt. <clears throat> With a bull, you take the, the entrails and the kind of stuff um, uh, outside of the camp, and there's another one that you would do that with too. But basically, other than that, you know, it is just a complete burnt offering. But, you know, like you read there, it speaks of to make atonement or to cover. In fact, read 32 1 again. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Forgiven, <clears throat> that's atoned for, forgiven, and sin is covered. So the whole purpose of a burnt offering was to cover our sin. Um, was it, <clears throat> did it cover our sins forever? No. And so this whole sacrificial system looks forward to the coming of Christ. But you'd have to repeat this um, on the Day of Atonement once a year with regular burnt offering. You'd have to repeat it every how often there was a sin committed. And it really <clears throat> did not ultimately atone or do away with it. The word atonement is an Anglo-Saxon word, and it, it literally means to be at one with God. Okay. So when our sins are covered, you know, they're kind of taken care of temporarily, but all these sacrifices really could not deal with the ultimate problem. So really kind of here, it's like the federal government with the budget playing kick the can down the road. You know what I mean? Okay, right. we're just going to borrow more money. Uh, well, what about the money that we already owe? What about the debt that's already been accrued? Well, we don't have an answer for that. We're just going to kick it on down the road. And right. We'll let our kids and grandkids worry about that one of these years and stuff. And so it almost seemed to be that way with this, but payday someday. And so all of these sins are finally atoned for with the death of Jesus Christ. And so <clears throat> a quick point about Leviticus and the whole sacrificial system. It is looking forward to the death of Jesus Christ when our sins will not only be covered but they will be permanently dealt with uh, by his blood because he is without sin, so he is able to die in that way uh, for us. So, um, uh, any rate, that's any thoughts you guys have there? I know as far as <clears throat> like an animal sacrifice, whether it's a, you know, slit in his throat, it's the blood, or you're or burning. I mean, there's a seriousness to that. I mean, if you had to do that every time you sin or once a year, and then that goat or sheep or calf, whatever it is, it has to come from someone too. So there's a cost there. And then just being a hunter and being a, a shepherd of livestock, I mean, you know, when you have to 
kill something kind of with your bare hands. I mean, there's a there's a real seriousness to that. Yeah. Too. I think people kind of read, take that for granted, I would think. Yep. Too, but. And that actually <clears throat> becomes very apparent in our third question. So keep that thought in mind and just read our third question. Let's kind of jump into that, okay? All right. Number three. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Ab Abihu, Abahu. Abahu, were put to death for disobeying God. What exactly was their sin? According to verse 3, what did this communicate to the rest of the children of Israel? Why is the holiness of God so important? Do we treat God <clears throat> this type of reverence today, should we? Right, well, let's, let's kind of look at this. And um, Austin, if you would, read for us uh, Leviticus 10, one, chat, verses 1, 2, and then we'll talk about those, and then we'll go into verse 3, okay? Abihu, Nadab and Abihu. Okay. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their um, respective fire pans and put the, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out of the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they did, and they died before the Lord. Uh, what exactly was their sin? We're not sure, but they did something God told them not to do. Uh, it had to do with the fire and the sacrifice and the incense there. And um, uh, you mentioned just a moment ago with the animal sacrifices, the seriousness of it. Um, this seems like a very small thing to us, but when God says something and God commands something, and God gives instruction, and it is not followed. There are ramifications. Um, I'm afraid we are sadly mistaken that we're in control. Mm. And because we live in the day of grace, and, and God is gracious. And thank God he is gracious. Because if this were just you know, uh, absolute uh, retributive justice, um, we would all be in bad shape. But go ahead and read verse 3, because I think that sheds a little more light on kind of the context of all this uh, Austin. Then Moses said to Aaron, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. This is fascinating. These were Aaron's two sons. He lost two sons this day. He was priest, and his sons were priests. Um, uh, he has some other sons that are going to take over. Um, but read that third verse again, because the Bible tells us, gives us a hint there, so Aaron kept silent. Read, read verse 3. Okay. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. He didn't give any complaint to God. Moses is, I think, saying, Aaron, keep your mouth shut. This is serious. This is God. And as difficult as that probably would have been, Aaron recognized that. Now, what did God say here? What did Moses say to Aaron about the holiness of God here? That whoever comes near me will be treated as holy. And, you know, basically it's not going to be disrespected and they're going to act right. Yeah. And the, the holiness of God is, is just such an incredible thing. And I don't think we can hardly even relate to this level of holiness. You know, that, that he's without sin and anything that is of disorder, anything that misses the mark, will not be tolerated. So what do you think this, this communicated to the rest of the children of Israel when they saw this? Think that to take the Lord seriously and His seriously. words and commands. Yep. And don't don't take. Like kind of yeah. Kind of that yeah. Don't take it lightly. Yeah. I mean, this is the real deal. I think you're exactly right, Austin. This is everybody. Look, we ain't make believe no more. Mm -hmm. This this ain't you know do what you want to do and get away with it. I mean, this is this is the real thing, and you know, and and so there was this understanding that God is holy, and he would be treated as holy, as different. 
And it wouldn't be one of these things where, okay, hey, you know, we just do what we want to and kind of get away with it. Now, we live in the age of grace now. And make no mistake about it, you know, God is very gracious. He's forgiving. Uh, and a lot of times he doesn't act when he's totally justified in acting. But that... Fact or the fact that we receive grace should never lead us to conclude. Yes. And a lot of there were a lot of deaths that people have been with in this time. Oh yeah, right. yeah. There, there was, there, w- there would be, there was. Um. Do we treat God with this type of reverence today? I think you just answered that, Austin. No. And I think even even we as Christians or you know the faithful followers, I still think miss the boat on the reverence, yeah. the seriousness of it, yeah. and the reverence. Yeah. It is, um, uh, and you know, whenever you come to God without a mediator, and you have to meet Him in your own goodness or holiness, it's a very serious thing. You see, we have all lived only in the age of grace in which Jesus Christ is acting as our mediator. Uh, But I will say this, if we choose to reject Jesus Christ, then we get to meet God as being our own mediator. And that's not the way you want to meet God, trust me. Uh, when all the when 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 uh, when everything you're accused of you've done, <laughs> you know? and you, you get out there and start talking about fairness, and the judge says you want fairness, okay, here's fairness. The only way out of the is Jesus, the Lord. Amen. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Okay, let's uh, look at the fourth one. And these these can be some complex questions. We're trying to go through these kind of kind of quick though. All right. Leviticus chapter 16 describes the Day of Atonement. What took place on this day? What is the scapegoat? Was the only day of was this the only day of the year that the priest could go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was? Well, the answer to that last question is yes. This was the only day when the priest, and it, it, actually it's the high priest, and he only once a year on the Day of Atonement, could go behind the veil into where the Holy and uh, holy of Holy was. Um, as far as the Day of Atonement, it was a day when uh, sin was, offering was given for the sin of the nation of Israel. And to, to sum up this very shortly, you would have a, a bull, a ram, and a goat that would be offered, and then you'd have a second goat, which was the scapegoat. Okay. The offering, first of all, would be for the priest individually that he would offer sins for himself. You didn't go in the Holy of Holies before you write. So there, this involved cha- washing, this involved changing of clothes, this involved a bull sacrifice, the goat sacrifice, the ram sacrifice, all of this. But at any rate, to make a long story short, um, the, and I'm going to leave some things out here, but basically the priest would offer uh, offerings and sacrifices for his own sin. So basically the first thing is the priest has got to get himself clean before he can go in before the um, uh, uh, presence of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant. Now remember, in Israel... There is no image. There are no idols. So the Ark of the Covenant is not God. The Ark of the Covenant is just where God would meet with the people. And the Ark of the Covenant, similarly, related, all it was was a box. And it was very holy, so that all there was it doesn't sound right. A box um, uh, about 48 inches long, 27 inches wide, uh, 27 inches high. And on top of it, it had a lid. The lid was called the mercy seat. And on top of the mercy seat, there were two cherubim with wings stretched out towards each other. And what this apparently symbolizes is that when you look in Ezekiel or in the book of Revelation, when you see God, he is surrounded by angels. They're almost carrying him, it it almost seems like. Um, Revelation uh, will speak of in the center and around the throne. So when God comes down over the mercy seat where the angels, the carvings of the angels, the cherubim, are towards each other. It's really a picture of the way that really happens. But there is no idol of God because God comes down. And so it, it's just a meeting place. where God, Well, they would go in there and they would go on the Day of Atonement and um, uh, they would offer uh, blood, they would offer sacrifices 
for the sin of the nation. And again, this would cover the sins for a year, all pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ. So that's what the sacrifice is. Now, the scapegoat. Okay, This is interesting because, remember, there are two goats. One is sacrifice. And they would actually, um, the priest would determine which goat was which um, uh, by the casting of lots, which you usually think of as a bad thing, but here it was a good thing, at least, you know, the way it was done. And um, uh, so they would cast lots, and they would determine um, uh, which goat the lot fell on for sacrifice, and then also which goat would be the scapegoat. And the scapegoat, now, think of it, the scapegoat, we th what do you think of when you think of a scapegoat? Just forget about the particular connotation here with the children of Israel. What do you think when you think of a scapegoat? The, the one that like usually gets the blame, mm -hmm. or like who you kind of point the finger at. <laughs> that's what I think of. I don't know if that's right. right. Yep. Okay. Spell scapegoat. Austin. <laughs> <laughs> I can't spell my name, but anyway. Uh, S-C-A-P-E-G-O-T. Right. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Go. Because it's escape. Scapegoat. Now, if you put an E in front of scape, what would you have? E scapegoat. A scapegoat. And so the, the, the scapegoat was kind of a actually mean an escape. What it offers is an escape for me. Let's say I've done something wrong and I throw the blame on fear mm -hmm. and I get away with it. So it <laughs> offers me a way to escape but therefore you become the scapegoat because you take the blame. Well, and they would pray over it. They would send the scapegoat in the wilderness and what this symbolized in some sense was carrying the sins away. Some people would say this symbolized carrying the sins back to Satan, although that argument I think is a Okay, that might work. But anyway, the sins are taken away. They're taken into the wilderness. Okay. And so this was the Day of Atonement. And it was once a year, and it was the most holy day. And um, uh, do, does the nation of Israel still, um, the Orthodox Jews, do they still recognize the Day of Atonement? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, they no, do. Not they do? Yeah, they do. They still recognize this day. And um, uh, you remember uh, there was a war that was fought on this day in Israel, modern Israel. Remember something called the Yom Kippur War? I've heard of that. Okay. The Yom Kippur is a day of atonement. The Arabs and the coalition attacked the nation of Israel on the holiest day of the year mm. when they could do no work. The army was actually at its kind of weakest point now because everybody's out. And that was a purposeful thing. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> you don't accidentally do that one, but mm -hmm. yes, they still do observe it, and it's a day of when they try to make things right. In fact, leading up this time, um, Jews, especially Orthodox Jews, will try to find forgiveness and try to get right. So anyway, but anyway, the Day of Atonement was a very, very, very special day. It is a very special day. So anyway. Okay, um, uh, let's jump into this next question. This right. is a fun one. All right. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, we find a prohibition against the practice of homosexuality. Is this prohibition only found in the Old Testament, or is it also repeated in the New Testament? Okay, um, Austin, if you would read uh, Leviticus 20, verse 13. Okay. If there is a man who lies with a male, as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a deceitful act, and they shall surely be put to death. There Okay, so you have this prohibition against homosexuality. Now let me be clear to say this. Um, in the context of the Old Testament, we were not under grace, we were under law. So you have an extreme punishment here. Um, no one is advocating that in the day of grace. So I think that's the one thing to say. But the question is, is this prohibition against homosexuality or is it in the Old Testament? Is it only for the Old Testament? Was it only for that period of time? Um, many commentators today are saying that we have completely misunderstood this prohibition and it's not really a prohibition and they come up with many reasons why it's not. Well, mm -hmm. what does the New Testament say? And we could look at several passages of Scripture. Um, Austin, if you turn to 1 Corinthians 6, um, 9 through 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, 
And if you don't mind, um, uh, uh, Spear turning to 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. Let's look at these passages of Scripture. 1 Timothy 8, 1 through 11. 8, 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. There are no eight chapters in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, um, 8 through 11. And then Spear is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And let's see what the Bible has to say. Uh, yeah, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you have that, uh, Austin? Yeah, I can get that. Okay, read that. Um, when you get 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Okay. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Mm-hmm. Do not be deceived, neither for, for fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor effeminate. Feminine. Feminine, nor homosexuals. And uh, go ahead and read the next couple of verses there, too, to get it. Nor thieves, nor to, how would you pronounce that one? The covetous, covetous, nor covetousness. Okay. Nor drunkards, nor revealers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And there's a lot of words called this. Episode. Yeah, there you go. So, <laughs> so what the Bible is clearly telling us is that these things are sin, and it lists a bunch of these. It lists adultery, um, fornication, um, theft. Different things. And, and among those, it lists also homosexuality. Um, and what it says is these are violations of the law of God. And if anyone, it's not talking about a person that commits a single act, but a person that does it habitually, unrepentantly, without any sense that this is in opposition to God. Um, so a person that is a thief right on with every repentance or a person that abuses um, a uh, you know, adultery or a person, whatever the case may be. Uh, but homosexuality is definitely in that list of things that are a violation of God's plan and God's purpose. And I think you have uh, 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. Timothy 1, 8 through 11. <clears throat> but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Okay. So these are two. We could go to Romans and some other places. But here you have two verses in the Bible that clearly teach us what is wrong. Among these things, it lists homosexuality. As not a part of God's plan and a violation of the way God created us and his purpose. Um, so for people that that try to just and this is this is a big deal because everybody's got a friend now mm-hmm. that, or, or family member. A family member, mm-hmm. everybody, we all do, that that struggles um, uh, with this. Um, and you know, the sin is not struggle. The sin is not a temptation. The sin, and the word sin literally means to miss the mark. Where a person misses the mark is when they act like part of, you know, a person that is, um, uh, has trouble with the truth. Or a person that um, uh, is um, uh, lustful. Or a person with habitual um, uh, adultery. Um, these things are not a part of God's plan. And, and I would say this, I'd probably make a lot of people mad, but I know I would, but the truth really is the truth. And I don't know how um, you can say that practicing homosexuality is consistent with the Bible. Um, there's forgiveness for any sin that uh, talk about um, unpardonable sin maybe, but other than that, there's forgiveness of any sin. But to repent means to change. It also means to agree with God that something is not right. And I think that's the real issue here is so many churches, you can find a church to tell you exactly what you want to on this issue. Trust me, if, if your goal is to go out and find somebody to justify this, um, uh, you can do it. The problem is getting the Bible to justify it and God to justify it, you really can't do that. Um, uh, 
And so, you know, um, this prohibition is definitely found in the uh, New Testament. Um, and I don't know how you get around this. It's found in, in the entire Bible. I've heard Pat, people say, well, it's only in obscure passages in the Old Testament. Well, that's really not, not true, as we've mm-hmm. seen here today. And um, uh, so um, uh, I guess we just leave that where it is. But um, uh, this was not God's plan from the beginning, and it definitely was not God's plan um, uh, as we go back into the book of Leviticus or in the New Testament. Let's look at our last, unless you have anything to add to that. No, I was just thinking it's sad that even our, our churches aren't holding to God's word on, on that. Yeah. We're on that specific issue that even, much less the culture in the country, but even our churches now are, are faltering on yeah. that. And if you say this, you immediately um, uh, irritate a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I guess it's a matter, are we going to be faithful to what God says or what, what society says? There's, there's, I don't see any way around what it says here. And I've, I've looked to some, you know, some, some, I've heard some arguments that try to make all sorts of gyrations and stuff that mm-hmm. um, uh, justify, but it's one of those things that's actually rather plain and clear right. in the Bible. Um, uh, and so if you try to justify it, um, uh, and uh, it's not good. But I think, you know, if you, if you love somebody, you want to be honest with them. Now, this is such a lightning rod issue that, I mean, hey, you know, it, uh, it causes all sorts of um, uh, responses. But at any rate, that's what the Bible says on it. So, all right, let's go to the last question. All right. Leviticus chapter 25 describes the sabbatical year and the year of Jubilee. What were these years? What was the difference between these two years, and what was their purpose? Okay, our time's about gone, but at any rate, the, the sabbatical year was once every seventh year, and there were a lot of regulations, but one of the things, the sabbatical year was the land was to lie fallow that year and not to be used. And, um, uh, and amazingly, God would just kind of have, um, uh, I guess, what's the thing for when stuff kind of volunteers and grows in a fallow mm-hmm. field or whatever right. because it's been planted so long and everything. Well, there would be enough there left over. You'd kind of, from the year before, you would just hold back, and then what would kind of grow up naturally, you could, could um, uh, you know, could utilize that. So, you know, there was um, uh, the ability that way. So sabbatical, and the sabbatical year was, um, uh, apparently they missed this for 70 years during a 490-year period, they didn't observe that. And how long was the Babylonian captivity? 70, 70 years. years. So the land lay fallow for 70 <laughs> years. <laughs> the math equation worked out. Eh? Yeah, I mean, either you can let it sit once every seven years, or you go to vacation to Babylon for 70 years, and the land will sit. You know. uh, and there were, were idolatry and other reasons, too, but... That really was a big one, and it uh, goes back to, again, when God says something, he means it, mm. and it is going to work out. Um, uh, so, at any rate, um, you know, it's amazing also that, uh, you know, God got into the whole thing of letting land lay fallow, and, you know, I mean, that's, don't you kind of do that when you rotate crops and let it lay fallow a year or whatever, you know? I was thinking of the, the amount of faith, too, it would have taken to, mm-hmm. to obey that, you know, that the Lord, you're totally dependent on him to provide in doing that. That's interesting. One of the more interesting years was the year of Jubilee, and you'd count off seven Sabbaths, and seven times seven is 49, so basically once every 50 years you had a year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was fascinating because um, uh, right of ownership would revert. Um, uh, in fact, land was held within the families and the tribes, and all this kind of complicated issue, but basically if I buy, you know, let's say you, you're the farmer, um, uh, if you buy a field from me, it's going to remain, on the year Jubilee, it's coming back to me. Okay, so if I sell you my land one year after the Jubilee, and it's going to be 49 years till we have another year of Jubilee, would you pay me more for that? Or if, say, next year is the year of Jubilee, and you get to use the year one land one year before it goes back to me? What should you pay the most for it when you got to use it? 49 years or one year? 49 years. Yep. So basically, yeah, what you're doing here is calculating rent. That's what you're doing. Because, you know, the ownership mm-hmm. of it is going to eventually revert back to the person from which it came. On the year of Jubilee, um, 
slaves would be set free. There's some, some, some details to this and everything. But basically everything went back to the way it was. So you had a year with the Jubilee, no matter how bad the situation was, it's going to be put back right on the year of Jubilee, which is kind of a neat thing if you think mm-hmm. about it. You know, everything's going to go back. Um, uh, so even if, like, for example, uh, well, let's look, make, make me the farmer here, but I'm not. So let's say I rent land from you, and I really get the shaft to you and take advantage of you and only give you a portion of what it's worth. Well, even if it's that bad, guess what? Your Jubilee is going back. So, I mean, it's, right. it, it kind of, you know, kind of really was kind of a neat thing, the year of Jubilee, and then the slaves would go back and everything. So, so God had a way of restoring. Um, I think that the year of Jubilee also in some ways symbolizes the fact that ultimately everything in God's economy will be made right. And uh, we talk about that in the millennial reign and ultimately the eternal states kind of being set. But it was this kind of whole thing. Remember this whole, this whole thing of government. This is a nation. God is ruling. God is in charge. And everything ultimately will be set and made right. So, Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's it, interesting. It, yeah. This is, uh, this is one of the more difficult books uh, that we're going to look at. So, uh, and it's not that difficult. It's just that we're not that familiar with it. Mm-hmm. So, because not as, as complex in some ways. Well, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. I know we covered some, some difficult topics tonight, but God bless and have a great evening. And um, I trust that you will enjoy reading the book of Leviticus. <laughs>